Well, thank you very much, Louise. And I did want to start by just, you know, mentioning my gratitude very much to the organisers of the conference for all their hard work and their efforts in arranging such a lovely meeting. I think it's not only so important for the vitality of our field and the development of it, but also actually for our well-being to have the opportunity to get together in person and meet up with friends of old, but also to get to know new people. So it's really such an important service and we're all terribly grateful to you. And I also wanted to just thank the Faculty of Law for its always warm welcome and gracious hospitality. <coughs> And today I'm going to talk about the idea or the device of implied intention as it applies in the context of choice of law and also in the related context of jurisdiction. But um, as we'll see, that's actually quite a different application. So I'm going to start with the conventional and I guess what is most familiar to people is the idea of the unexpressed choice of law in the context of choice of, uh, sorry, the, the idea of the unexpressed choice of the parties in the context of choice of law. <clears throat> now, of course, um, students of the history of our field will know that originally, as, as the idea of party autom autonomy was articulated in private international law, it never referred to the party's expressed choices because, as it has been noted, that was unheard of for the parties expressly to choose a governing law. So references to party autonomy initially were to the party's implied intentions rather than to their actual intentions. And that's really a very radical difference to the way that we use party autonomy today. <clears throat> so um, what's also interesting about the historical use of the unexpressed intention of the parties is that many of the writers were referring to the idea of unexpressed choice in the context of family law in the context of the identification of the regime to regulate the party's marital property entitlements and also the idea of marriage validity. <clears throat> and I'm going to come back and, and mention that briefly uh, a bit later in my presentation. Now, the idea of the party's unexpressed choices in that particular context were not derived by reference to any data about the actual party's preferences, either really or implicitly, but rather the party's preferences were derived by reference to presumptions, and I'm sure that's actually very well known. Um, and these presumptions, as is well known, focused in particular on the law of the place of contracting. <clears throat> but what's really interesting in some of the earlier cases is that those references to the place of contracting were justified in a particular way, which will be familiar to students of political philosophy, and it wasn't about the party's mutual intentions that the law of the place of contracting should govern, but rather by reference to the idea of tacit consent in the style of Locke, that each of the parties to the contract individually and separately had tacitly consented to the application of the law in force at the place of contracting. Yes, so the mutuality was incidental. The fact is that their consent was derived by their individual although presumed consent to the operation of the law in force at the place of contracting. Um, in some legal systems, <clears throat> that presumption was replaced by another presumption in favour of the law of the place of performance, and that's well known as well, of course. Now, there was a lot of consternation about this idea of the reference to the party's presumptions and to the idea of the party's implicit choices, and essentially those... Um, those uh, objections to this device are almost as old as the device itself. It's been pointed out cogently and persuasively by many, many uh, commentators that this is artificial and fictional. It produces a very uncertain result which makes it unpredictable and often requires litigation. Of course, yeah, um, it's also been pointed out many times that the presumptions often do lead to the application of all law of the forum. And that can be understood, I suppose, because if you're asking the judge <clears throat> to determine the applicable law, this is rarely a question that occurs in the abstract. And in many cases, the question that the court is actually answering is, is the law of the forum the governing law? 
And when the question is framed in that particular way, you can see the inclination of a court to justify the application of the law of the forum. Because these days we do actually have information about the factors that influence party choices. Leaving aside the question of familiarity, which can only be relevant if one party is able to prevail on the other, but in the event that the parties actually do reach a mutual decision as to the choice of law, the factors which have been shown to influence those choices are the neutrality of the law, the sophistication of the law, and the balance that the law strikes between the parties. And of course, any sensible judge is going to think that the law of their own system has those virtues. So it's understandable in a way that a judge might be inclined to conclude that the law of the forum is the law that should be applied by one means or another. <clears throat> anyway, notwithstanding those very um, strident objections, there have been, as we all know, very significant changes to contract choice of law in fact, and that's because of the increasing dominance of that express choice of law clause. So it's gone from being something that was unheard of to something that is not quite ubiquitous, but extremely common in cross-border contracting to find an express choice of law clause. So that has rendered the need to refer to other choice of law rules um, much more marginal. Um, not only is there a greater focus in practice on express choice of law agreements, but in addition to that, there's this increasing concern that the judges should not be given too much discretion otherwise to apply the, uh, another law that they might choose by various means. And we can see that in a range of multilateral and regional instruments, for example, in the Hague Principles that were referred to earlier, and also in the Rome 1 regulation. This increased uh, constraint on the operation of the unexpressed choice. So now what we're looking for is not a choice that can be imputed from the facts, but one which is demonstrated with a reasonable degree of certainty, or however you like to express those particular terms. <clears throat> Notwithstanding that refinement to the rules, many concerns persist about the use of the unexpressed intention in practice. And very similar um, concerns are consistently and persistently raised by commentators, um, particularly about the uncertainty of the product, the unpredictability, the fictionality of the exercise that's been engaged in. And sometimes more colourfully, this has been described um, <clears throat> by one writer in particular as a useless and dangerous method, which probably slightly overstates the case, but that's typical of the writing of this terrific fellow. I'm sure you're all more or less familiar with Thomas Fatty. Is that how you pronounce it, Richard? Great. <laughs> We're, going with, <laughs> We're going with Fatty. He's, I commend him to you highly. I'm sure you've heard of his uh, very famous sort of throwaway line that private international law is the fugal music of law. Yes. Um, and other terrific little characterizations. This is taken from his little book called Polarized Law, which was published in 1914. I commend it to you very highly. It's an absolute page turner, and it's <laughs> marked, seriously, it's marked by his great enthusiasm for the subject. He's much claimed by public international lawyers, and indeed most of his work is in that area. Um, but there's too many interesting things to say about Thomas Betty. I will just, um, by way of example, mention to you that he used to write under the pseudonym um, of Irene Clyde uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And um, what he was writing about under the pseudonym of Irene Clyde was utopian feminism. <laughs> that is absolutely not to the point of this paper. <laughs> <laughs> but he's terrific. And I love this paper as well. He was also an early proponent of vegetarianism, which is also not relevant. But I love this because he looks, you know, whenever I'm teaching the topic of jurisdiction, <laughs> I always get caught up on the idea of the natural forum, which to me doesn't look like the roles building. To me, it looks more like this sort of setting. The idea of the parties really slamming it out in the context of some sort of bushwalk in the forest. Anyway, once again, it's not on the exam. <coughs> um, 
The idea of unexpressed choice can be found in many, many other areas of private international law. Um, and just to toss out a couple of examples is, is the idea of the reasonable or the legitimate expectations of the parties, and that was much referred to in the previous session. And um, this is a, a terribly interesting idea of the parties' reasonable or legitimate expectations as to choice of law. Indeed, it's often used in order to justify the choice of law rule in contract, but it's used as well sometimes to justify, at an abstract level, the, to the tort choice of law rule. And the High Court of Australia in 2000 said that the reasonable expectations of the parties was the chief theoretical justification in favour of the application of the law of the place of the delict. Now, that becomes um, curious, if not bizarre, when you bear in mind that five years later the High Court said that when we, in Australia, if the tort occurred abroad, the Australian Court must also consult the choice of law rules of the foreign legal system. And whether that comports to the reasonable expectations of the parties is <laughs> an open question and the empirical research is yet to be done, but I feel fairly certain that outside of this room, there aren't too many um, mums and dads who worry about the question of renvoi. Um, so it's used in this context and it has been once again persuasively and cogently attacked in the commentary, particularly as being entirely circular, that the party's reasonable expectations must be based on what the law is, at least in part. So to you know, attempt to justify the law by reference to what the law itself is, is obviously unhelpful. In addition, and quite interestingly, of course, implied choice plays a prominent role in determining the governing law for matrimonial property. And the common law way is to use the contract choice of law rules to determine the applicable law for matrimonial property regimes. Um, indeed, it was used in this context by the so-called father of party autonomy. Does anyone know who that is? Don't be shy. French? Helen? Anyone? Hooray! Yes, this was one of the contexts in which he developed the idea of party autonomy in particular and he used the idea of expressed and implied um, agreement interchangeably but really what he was referring to was the party's implied um, choices of law to govern their matrimonial property regime and of course it's been used many times since by courts including by the New South Wales Court of Appeal in this interesting 2010 case of Murakami and Wiriadi, uh, in which case Chief Justice Spiegelman, who was a real hero of private international law in Australia, said that the parties to an Indonesian marriage had a reasonable expectation that their entitlement to property, brackets, including real estate in New South Wales, was to be determined according to Indonesian law. And the way of giving effect to this reasonable expectation was to refer to an implied agreement. And there was absolutely no data whatsoever to support that expectation or the agreement in that case. <clears throat> in addition, and probably most importantly these days, the idea of the parties presumed or reasonable expectations as reasonable business people is very frequently employed in the context of interpreting pathological and incomplete jurisdiction agreements. <clears throat> and I'm sure you're familiar with it in that context. That brings me on to the second part. Oh my God. Six minutes. Six. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's lucky. <laughs> this is exactly how long this takes. So in the context of jurisdiction, the idea of implied choice is rather different. Um, of course, we don't try to resolve the question of jurisdiction in the same way that we resolve the, the question of choice of law, although we, in both contexts, start off with the express choices of the parties. We don't then say, in the absence of an effective express choice of court, what is the party's implied choice of court? Um, of course, law and economics would have a crack at justifying the rules in those terms, but <clears throat> it's very rarely ass uh, asserted that the parties implicitly agreed to an unwritten choice of court agreement. But instead, most of the um, uh, actual applications of 
implied choice in the context of jurisdiction concern unilateral choices of the parties. And one of the most well known, of course, is the idea that the subjection of a defendant to the common law court's jurisdiction based on presence can be justified by reference to their tacit consent, reflecting what I was saying earlier. So that's very well known and again it's been much discussed and criticised by many learned authors and I'm just going to leave it there as a very prominent example of the application of implied choice in this context. But otherwise, the kinds of unexpressed choices that come up regularly, again, one of the most famous is, again, a basic common law rule of jurisdiction <clears throat> relating to the implied submission of the defendant. And this occurs when the defendant has grounds on which to contest the jurisdiction of the court and fails in a timely way to raise those concerns. They will be taken to have waived their rights to, uh, to contest jurisdiction. It's a bit unfortunate that the doctrine of waiver is commonly used in this context because it's awfully confused. Um, and indeed, you can tell the level of confusion that occurs in this context because the courts will commonly mix up the ideas of waiver and election in a way that we can understand, but it hardly assists in the clarity of the law. Secondly, and actually quite commonly these days, is a circumstance in which it's alleged that one of the parties has lost the right to apply for a stay of proceedings on the basis of there being an international arbitration agreement or an exclusive foreign jurisdiction agreement by reference to the way that they've conducted themselves in proceedings. And again, this is generally determined on the basis of waiver. There are some very nice and very interesting points that I could go on to make in this context. The one that I find the most beguiling is the question of choice of law to determine these waivers. Almost without exception, courts apply the law of the forum to that particular point, and that can be justified sometimes on the basis that what's been waived is a procedural question which ought to be determined by the law of the forum. It has also been suggested that it could be uh, governed by the law of the forum, at least in crazy legal systems like Australia, where we insist that on equitable points, the law of the forum must be applied if you treat questions of waiver and election as equitable principles. In the context of loss of rights to <clears throat> insist on a jurisdiction or an arbitration agreement, it's a different matter altogether though. It, it seems fairly clear as a matter of principle that loss of those rights ought to be governed by the proper law of the jurisdiction or the arbitration agreement. But in practice, in the English and Australian courts anyway, the courts typically refer only to the law of the forum without any choice of law analysis. So where does this leave us altogether? <clears throat> it's a difficult concept, the Im implicit choice of the parties. It certainly does leave a wide margin of discretion to whoever's enforcing the law. Um, certainly it's very difficult to rely on the same justifications for upholding implicit choices as is used for explicit choices. So the ideas of efficiency and relative simplicity in judicial decision making, the idea of certainty and predictability do not conform with this particular technique. However, it is a very interesting concept. It's, it's proved to be incredibly durable, notwithstanding consistent criticism, pretty much starting with Westlake and continuing to date. Indeed, it's fairly commonly suggested that because the idea of implied choice of law overlaps to some extent with the idea of the objective proper law of the contract, we should shoot the whole concept in the head and push it into the river. I think that goes much too far. I think it's an interesting concept I've only described some of the potential applications of it here. I'm not sure if it's ubiquitous. I think it might come fairly close to it. And I think in addition, it might be one of the golden threads of private international law. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I have first to express my sincere thanks to the organizers for all the wonderful work they have done and for offering the opportunity to this, uh, this most distinguished audience. So, just how free is the free choice of law? At first glimpse, this appears to be a non-topic. Don't we all know Article 3, Paragraph 1, Clause 1 of the Rome 1 regulation expressing the choice of law is free? Yes, of course we do, but this is only the bedrock of international commercial contracts. It appears to be pretty clear and, in particular, it appears to be conclusive. But all those aficionados of European conflicts law know very well that there are, is a plethora of intersystematic challenges already. I've only to name articles uh, three, paragraphs three and four, and articles five, six, seven, eight, and nine of the Rome One regulation. So. This, already this might be an indication that uh, the elves are, are not what they seem to be and that Article 3, Paragraph 1 of the Rome 1 regulation is not as conclusive as it should be. But the challenges don't stop here. Recently, at least in some uh, countries on uh, states uh, on the continent, we've experienced challenges from quarters outside the Rome 1 regulation, which could possibly and deeply affect the validity uh, choice of law clauses. These challenges have been raised uh, from the quarters of the Unfair Contract Terms Directive, okay, consumer contracts, once again, our beloved favorite, they have been raised from the quarters of the law against unfair commercial practices and they have raised under the means of the injunctions directive which is now directive 2022 uh, uh, eu challenge those challenges have occurred of course in my home country uh, germany they have occurred at least at the first instance level in spain and thirdly, they have occurred in Austria, where they have reached the level of the Supreme Court. And amongst other questions, the Austrian Oberste Gerichtshof felt duly obliged to make a reference uh, to the European Court of Justice in the pending case of Verein für Konsumenteninformation versus Amazon Luxembourg. And I cannot do better than to borrow the words uh, from the commentator on the reference on, in Euro Law, rather, who wrote, in the, quote, in the tiny Dutch Grand Duchy of Luxembourg is a tiny branch of the corporate king, Amazon. It subjects its customers to buying their goods under Luxembourg law. Is that fair? And what happens to Amazon's choice of law after it has been forced through the latest mesh of measures of six pieces of EU legislation which determine the applicable national law. So, it might at first glimpse to be, appear as a non-topic, but in fact it is a topic. Let me first address the challenge arising from the possible challenge arising from the quarters of the Unfair Contract Terms Directive, which of course is limited uh, to consumer contracts. In Annex 1, uh, in the Annex, number 1, literal Q of that very directive, we find some kind of ban on jurisdiction and arbitration clauses. They are expressly listed. And some of you might know that the Court of Justice has taken a rather firm stance against such clauses. But, coming back to our topic, choice of law clauses are not mentioned expressly, expressly in that very list. Can we just draw from jurisdiction arbitration clauses being expressly listed and choice of law clauses being not listed an argumentum e contrario 
in favor of choice of law clauses. Well, another time, the case is not that clear since the annex is not exhaustive. It only lists certain clauses, but in an exemplary manner. So, hell. Well, and of course we know that um, jurisdiction clauses are subject to a review under the uh, Brussels 1, Brussels 1B regime too, so that the Rome Convention might not be the utmost defense against a challenge from this quarter. Next challenge from arising under the unfair contract terms directive on consumer contracts is there a transparency review to be constituted under Article 5, Clause 1 of that very directive? It appears rather surprising to disregard a clause reading something like this contract is subject to English law as not being not transparent. But something like this has been argued in lower German courts. And um, for instance, the choice of law clauses inserted in the standard terms and conditions of Ryanair of course referring to Irish law, have been made subject to close scrutiny. So, okay. And for which reason? Yes. This appears to be an unconditional choice of law, but remember Article 6, Paragraph 2, Clause 2 of the Rome 1 regulation establishing the more favorable law principle, which is not expressly mentioned and reiterated in this kind of choice of law clauses. And it might inspire a wrong impression on the consumer that only the chosen law will govern the contract. So the seemingly unconditional choice of law clause might collide at first glance with the more favorable law principle. Well, shall we urge upon businesses uh, to repeat, to reiterate Article 6, Paragraph 2? Well, imagine uh, a clause mirroring this very article and being presented to consumers. This could pose a severe challenge of being intransparent, non-transparent, in itself, for the very wording of the rule isn't uh, that clear. Most of us have uh, taken uh, weeks to study it and uh, to come to grips uh, with it. So, some kind uh, of confusion has to vanish from the minds of uh, judges anyway. A distinction has to be made between the choice as such and the content of the chosen law. The content of the chosen law must not be subject to a transparency review. Nor, and this is another challenge which has been posed uh, at the level of lower German courts, uh, lower courts in Germany, uh, was the allegation that uh, the chosen law lacks objective connections with, with the contract the circumstances under which the uh, contract operates. Well, this clearly collides and is in strong contrast with Article 3, Paragraph 1 of the Rome Convention, which that would, should do the trick. Let me step uh, forward uh, to the next topic, namely, the possible relation between parties' choice of law and the law against unfair commercial practices. The latter, the law against unfair commercial practices, takes an abstract approach, looking on the effect on the market, and of course, this has to be reconciled with the relevance of the concrete contract. How shall we do it? And uh, 
the ex uh, and the experts of European conflicts law and amidst as of co uh, of course say uh, uh, well um, sorry um, law against unfair commercial practices and conflict of laws that's Article Six Rome Two, not Rome One anyway. So how to reconcile this? In fact. A two-tier approach in conflicts law has to be adopted and is adopted in court practice. The first tier relates to determining a law applicable to unfair commercial practices, and that's where Article 6, Rome 2 is about to gather. If you uh, refrain from uh, characterizing the matter as uh, one Coming against uh, coming under Article Six, you have to stick with Article Four, as, as some authors suggest. So, this the law applicable determined under Article Six, Room Two, might raise an incidental question, namely, as to which law is applicable to the contract. And of course, this is where Rome One and Article 3, Rome 1, step in. But under the auspices of a challenge based on the law against unfair commercial practices, one piece of the jigsaw cannot be applicable, namely Article 3, Paragraph 5, in conjunction with Article 10, Paragraph 1, the so-called bootstrap principle, because this relates to the level of the concrete contract and not to the abstract level and the effect on the markets. Well, another thought is worth to be considered, namely whether, they could not, whether there is a protection paradox ensuing if the challenge under the law against unfair commercial practices exerts a negative result in validating the choice of law clause, particularly in consumer contracts. Striking out the choice of law clause would deprive the concrete consumer of any benefits he might gather from the chosen law and might deduce him to, to his position under the law applicable to the contract absent a choice of law. One of the two limbs necessary for the more favorable law principle coming into operation appears to vanish. Well, is this the price one the concrete consumer has at a concrete a consume, concrete consumer under concrete contract has to pay for the abstract review and for keeping the market clean? One might doubt that if one has a closer look at the holding which might ensue from a claim based on the law against unfair commercial practices. Namely, that this has only effects pro futuri and might not affect contracts already concluded. So the assumption that a choice of law clause which is found in contracts already concluded might be subject uh, to be stri to striking out is ill-defined. This might protect against the protection paradox, which is not ensuing at all. So the third challenge I mentioned at the very beginning, appears to arise under the injunctions directive. But, uh, well, some scrutiny should be invested in the question whether this is an additional challenge at all, and whether the injunctions directive adds anything to the over picture, which has not to be related to the unfair contract terms directive, on the one hand, or the unfair commercial practices directive, on the other hand. And so it is. The injunctions directive has an accessory nature. It only offers the procedural means to the enforcement of the directives listed in the annex to the injunctions directive. 
and the injunctions directive does not implement own substantive standards. Yet again, as the protection paradox ensued, and the answer is no, not as to ex not further than it would extend uh, ex appear under the unfair commercial practices directive. My last point as some kind of a classic and already some 15 years old at least. This is whether we have a review of content of the choice of law clause as to substance. There have been two different strands of uh, such review as to substance. The first applying the standards taken from the Lex Fori, from the law of the forum, and the second one operating under the auspices of the law which would be applicable absent a choice of law. The argument against allowing, permitting such uh, review of content as to substance should be clear. It's an argument of a contrary of ensuing consequentially from the articles of the Rome 1 regulation expressly addressing situations where the European legislator found it worth to implement particular mechanisms protecting against possible effects of choice of law clauses. I only have to name the more favorable law principle as enshrined in Article 6, Paragraph 2, and Article 8, <coughs> Paragraph 2 of the Rome 1 regulation. The European legislator was aware of the necessity to protect weaker parties, and it did so by implementing two conflicts mechanisms, skirting and skipping any review of content as to substance. Another time, I beg your pardon if I remind you to recall that the more favorable law principle presupposes that there is a valid choice of law, else there wouldn't nothing to be compared to the, uh, the law absent a choice of law. So. It has been put forward in favor of a review of content as to substance that Article 3, Paragraph 5 refers to the law designated in the choice of law clause. Right. But this fifth paragraph comes only into operation where the trick is not already done by the previous paragraphs. This time, Article 3, Paragraph 1 does not allow to open, an inter uh, system, open up an intersystematic challenge. Furthermore, a review based on the ch chosen law would have to collide with the exclusion of a dreaded friend of Renoir as enshrined in Article 20 of the Rome, uh, Rome, not Rome 1 regulation, but Rome 1 regulation for Reviewing the choice of law clause necessarily implies some conflictual content of the review standards, which to apply, which is not permitted by the exclusion of Rome. So I will not even eat up those five minutes. I come to my concluding remarks and uh, ask your forgiveness if I take a fairly firm stance. Interesting challenges to party autonomy are not only ahead, but they are already present. Remember the, the pending reference with the Luxembourg Court. And we have to learn that Article 3, Paragraph 1, Rome 1 regulation is not a solitaire, a standalone, that has to be seen in wider context. Yet, most challenges. I've outlined are arguable at best, though. So the principle of party autonomy 
cherish and heralded as heralded as it is might survive those challenges firmly alive. Thank you very much. Colleagues uh, and friends, uh, I am really very glad to be here and I am honored to present my paper within the plenary session, Choice of Law. I have to thank two organizers of this conference. My issue is uh, escape clauses and legal certainty in private international law, and the paper is divided into four parts. First, the role of escape clauses, then I will concentrate to national private international law codification, third, European private international law, and fourth, some final remarks. Uh, Introductory remarks concern the role of uh, escape clauses. Escape clauses are important uh, instrument of uh, private international law that allows for derogation from a general conflict rule. They are used in special cases when a particular situation shows a closer relation to a law other than that determined as applicable by the conflict rule. The typical criteria are manifestly closer relation, strongest relation, but even reasonable arrangement. It is also rather important criterion. Example is Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Rome 1 Regulation on the Law Applicable to Contractual Obligations, where it is clear from all the circumstances of the case that the contract is manifestly more closely connected with the country other than that indicated in Paragraphs 1 or 2, the law of that other country shall apply. I have to say that uh, the problem is what approach should be taken to escape clauses, how could we establish the balance between flexibility and legal certainty. So flexibility and legal certainty, it is one of crucial point regarding escape clauses. Escape clauses allow for certain flexibility. They give certain space to judges and they are really demanding on judges, in particular in the Czech Republic, but I think also in common law countries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, escape clauses may represent some danger if legal certainty and predictability is concerned. There is a famous Latin saying that claims exceptio firmat regulam, and uh, the practice shows that exceptions uh, to rules may be generally permitted, and the rule itself should not be threatened thereby. However, there are some serious objections regarding escape clauses, and one of the crucial question is whether it is practicable to set some exact conditions into the escape clause. If you look in the past, uh, 
Probably the first escape clause was included in the so-called Vienna Draft of Private International Law Act of 1913-1914, which was uh, the basis for private, Europe, private uh, international law legislation in Central Europe. Section 16 reads, if the circumstances of a particular case make it obvious that not these laws, but different laws correspond to the reasonable arrangement of legal relations, the different laws should be applied. And of course, I have to point out uh, the most obvious, mo most important escape clause, general escape clause included in Swiss Private International Law Act of 1987, which was inspiration for private international law codifications worldwide. Escape clauses are included not only in national codifications, but also in international conventions, several international conventions, and of course also in European private international law. Uh, typical problem is with interpretation of uh, escape clauses, as escape clauses are uh, not uh, defined in general somewhere. So the formulations that are included are not identical. Uh, in general, delegation from applicable law is permitted if the case has much closer connections with another law, considering all circumstances. So that is the general uh, concept, but sometimes, as you probably know, the escape clauses include some additional conditions to be applied. Objections. Uh, relevant objections are connected with the danger of excessive flexibility. Uh, we speak uh, about uh, uh, the purposive decisions to which may lead escape clauses. Uh, sometimes it is said that escape clauses undermine conflict rules and may lead to abuse of uh, the lex fori. My last general remark concerns overlapping issues because there are also other instruments of private international law that are used to assure flexibility uh, and use uh, sometimes the same criteria that is either closest connection or reasonable arrangement. Uh, among others, flexible connecting factors or means for solving gaps, but sometimes they can be also overlapped with order public or even overriding mandatory rules. Uh, let's turn to national codifications. There are uh, national, in national codifications we find general and specific escape clauses and regarding general escape clauses the most famous example probably is article 15 paragraph 1 of the Swiss Private International Law Act, which reads, as an exception, any law referred to in this act is not applicable if, considering all the circumstances, it is apparent that the case has only very loose connections with this law and that the case has much closer connections with another law. I take the liberty to be here and to, to introduce the Czech Act on Private International Law, which is very recent, which entered into force on 1st of January 2014. And Section 24 also includes a general escape clause. It shall be possible in completely ex exceptional cases to decline from the application of the law which should be applied under the provisions of this act provided it seems inappropriate and contrary to a reasonable and fair arrangement of the participants relation following a due and reasoned assessment of a set of all the circumstances of the case 
in particular the reasonable expectations of the participants regarding the application of another legal order under these conditions and provided the rights of third persons are not prejudiced, the law, the application of which corresponds to such an arrangement shall be applied. I would like just to mention that this clause, if we compare it with the Swiss Private International Law Act, with which undoubtedly was inspiration for this clause, is broad. It includes a lot of conditions which are perhaps important guideline for the judges. These general escape clauses will be used only exceptionally and the cases really are rare. I have one example in recent practice of Czech courts. It was a case of a Czech-German marriage, a judicial action to determine that immovable property located in the territory of the Czech Republic is part of the community property of spouses. So it was a declaratory action and uh, it was a particular situation as uh, the uh, claimant was the wife, she was German nationality, the defendant, the husband, had both Czech and German citizenship so that under the Czech law he was considered to be Czech citizen. Under the German law, there is a specific institution, community of accrued gains, and under the conditions of the particular case, this property would not become part of community property during the marriage. While under the Czech law, and thus otherwise agreed, which was not, not the case, such a property, uh, there were immovables, uh, the, and uh, the husband asserted that he uh, gained the immovables only with his own separate money, and he was a sole owner recorded in the Czech register of immovables. So under the Czech law, unless otherwise agreed, this uh, property was part of community property. Uh, the former Private International Law Act had only one simple provision, property relations between uh, spouses shall be governed by the common nationality. If the nationality is different, Czech law will be applied. So there was no escape, no possibility, and the judges expressed both in the first instance and in the second instance <laughs> expressed their doubts. The spouses were habitual resident in Germany, they married in Germany, they were at the stage, uh, divorce just started in Germany, and this case was uh, decided in the Czech court. So the argument would be inconsistency in decision-making, no external harmony, and I think that would right be a case where a general escape clause might be applied. But I have to say that under the new Czech Private International Law Act, this uh, criterion of uh, nationality has been replaced by the habitual residence, so that under the new codification, this case would be clearly uh, governed by the German law. As regards uh, specific uh, escape clauses, unfortunately within the time limits which I am supposed to observe, I only have to say that while general uh, escape clauses um, may be applied against any rule within the codification, specific escape clauses are always formed as an exception to a particular rule. Let's start with European private international law. Uh, there are some examples in both uh, Rome uh, regulations and even in Rome zero there is included a general escape clause. So I will start with Article 4 of the Rome Convention on Applicable Law in the Absence of Choice. Uh, the principle is uh, the closest connection. This principle is, as you all well know, followed by presumptions, the first presumption being characteristic performance principle. In 
Paragraph 4 is included uh, escape clause. These presumptions shall be disregarded if it appears from the circumstances as a whole that the contract is more closely connected with another country. And uh, this uh, paragraph 5 was already subject matter of important case law of the European Court of Justice. Uh, Article 4 met with a lot of criticism and uh, as you know uh, in, within the Rome 1 regulation it was completely restructured uh, with uh, similar tools but it's another question and an escape clause is now included in paragraph 3 the contract should be manifestly more closely connected with another country that means that the importance of escape clause in my opinion has weakened uh, there is, uh, however, important provision in recital 20 in the preamble, which reads, while the contract is manifestly more closely connected with a country other than that indicated in Article 4, 1 or 2, an escape clause should provide that the law of that other country is to apply. In order to determine that country, a count should be taken inter alia of whether the contract in question has a very close relationship with another contract or contracts. Famous case law. There are two fa cases, the first being Intercontainer and second being Heger Schmidt. Uh, with respect to my time limit, I will just uh, introduce the closing remark or the legal sentence uh, of the European Court of Justice in Intercontainer because this uh, uh, case was also referred to in very interesting article within Journal of Private International Law. So where is it clear from the circumstances as a whole that the contract is more closely connected with a country other than that determined uh, on the basis of Article 4, 2 to 4 of the Rome Convention. It is for the court to disregard those criteria and apply the law of the country with which the contract is most closely connected. So the uh, criterion of the court was that the circumstances should clearly suggest that uh, the law that should be applied may be derogated from the uh, rule that should uh, be applied, that is from the general presumption based on uh, the principle of characteristic performer and his establishment or his seat. Heger Schmidt, a relatively new case, uh, which is, uh, I think, still more interesting because there are two commission contracts uh, for the contracts for the arrangement of carriage. The verse, first was concluded between French contractor and uh, French agent, while the second commission contract was concluded between the French contractor that was the French uh, agent of the first contract and uh, the German agent, uh, so I simplify the agent uh, whose place of business is Germany, it's a company, Heger Schmidt. Uh, there was uh, raised uh, compensation for loss. Uh, it was sought from both foreign agents in the French court and uh, the question was which law should be applied. There is the general resumption in Article 4, uh, Paragraph 2 of the Rome Convention that clearly leads to the German law that was the law of uh, establishment of the German agent whose performance is characteristic, I think, that can be clear. On the other hand, there was a French law, and French law mattered really because the first contract was concluded between two French companies, and also it, France was the place 
of delivery. Uh, the questions for preliminary ruling were connected with the characteristic of the Commission contract. I, I am afraid I have to leave aside this interesting question and just concentrate on the escape clause. So the uh, question that was uh, uh, referred to by the Cour de Cassation was the use of the escape clause if the set contract would not be considered a courage contract and as such would be subject to the general presumption in Article 4, Paragraph 2. Is it possible to allow the law applicable to the relationship between the contractor, first agent, and the second agent to be determined on the basis of the place of establishment of the first agent? Uh, the court uh, decided regarding just uh, the interpretation of the escape clause. So first, uh, the question whether the applicable law can be determined solely according to the uh, location of the principal first forwarding agent who was uh, French and uh, the second forwarding agent was German. Uh, the court uh, uh, arrive to conclusion that the court, that means referring court, must compare the connections between that contract and, on the one hand, the country whose law is designated by the presumption, and on the other, the other country concerned. In so doing, the court must take account of the circumstances as a whole, including the existence of other contracts connected with the contract in question. I think uh, this uh, decision may raise some question. So first, uh, in my opinion, this uh, contract between the German agent and the French contractor was clearly commission contract. The characteristic performant was the agent. The agent concluded the contract in his name, having responsibility, and I think it would expect that the contract be governed by the German law. So the presumption in Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Rome Convention, in my opinion, is fully applicable here. The argument of the court that there is change, chain of contracts, so it refers clearly, at least in my opinion, to that recital 22 preamble of the Rome 1 regulation. This argument cannot be accepted because the contract were not concluded between the same contracting parties. There were different uh, subjects of these contracts. I know that uh, my uh, opinion is perhaps uh, uh, considered to be conservative, in particular uh, English jurisprudence will, would characterize it as a strong model, and English jurisprudence would be perhaps somewhere in the, on the halfway between the strong and the weak model, but I think that what really matters is legal certainty. In this case, if I am conservative, I apologize. Perhaps that can be subject matter of further discussion. Final remarks, I know that my time is up, so just a note at the very end. Discretion of a decision-making authority plays a significant role in the whole process. It would depend on a judge whether he or she would be brave enough to break through the rule in favor of an exception on the one hand, and on the other to point out at limits to be respected in the interests of legal certainty. Thank you for your attention.